blockchain will reach mass adoption when no one knows they're using blockchain. Hi, everybody. This is Value Tokenized. Uh, I'm Masha. This is Ksenia. Uh, and when we're speaking about investors in crypto and blockchain projects, uh, previously, you would usually uh, think of retail guys who purchase tokens and in ICOs or maybe angel investors yeah. who put some funds in um, on the seed stage. And or hedge funds. Yeah. Uh, however, right now, we really see this um, crypto venture capital, this traditional venture funds who are exploring this thing either as a natural uh, pro kind of extension of their existing portfolios mm -hmm. or just some very interesting tracks um, for themselves. Um, and I guess it is the sign that the industry is maturing. Yeah, I think it is the sign. And actually, it's very relevant for both investors to understand what are the right projects and how industry is evolving. And for projects who are looking to attract more capital to further develop and create this infrastructure for blockchain industry. Yeah, and that's exactly why uh, today we invited Stephen McKeon, uh, professor at University of Oregon and a partner at Collaborative Fund, who recently started uh, to invest in blockchain projects and formed a separate full team for this. And Stephen is going to tell us uh, about that, how they choose projects and what are their criteria for investment. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Thank you very much for joining us today at Value Tokenized. It's a pleasure. We know that you're a finance professor. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how did your interest in security tokens start? My home institution is University of Oregon. I've been a professor there for about eight years uh, teaching finance. And right now I'm visiting um, Cambridge. And so I'm affiliated with a judge business school and there's a center here called Center for Alternative Finance. Um, and a, a big part of what they research is uh, blockchain. And so there's a bunch of research reports and that type of thing that, that your viewers might be interested in. But the, the background is that I've always studied securities. So I've studied debt contracts and employee uh, options and various types of financial securities for basically my whole career. And so when I became interested in blockchain, uh, of course, like most people, you know, the first uh, introduction was Bitcoin and found that really interesting. And then as I dug in and thought about, you know, how might this impact the things I've been studying for a long time, financial securities it sort of led me down this path of, of tokens. So that's how I ended up uh, kind of focusing on this segment of the space. And now you recently joined a collaborative fund which uh, has been focused on projects in sustainable urban development and health, uh, some projects for kids, so really a big fund and with a variety of tracks. Uh, but the main principles are collaborative efforts and um, creating a better infrastructure. And now the fund uh, decided to open a new track, blockchain and crypto. So can you tell us what was the main incentive to start this I mean, really, blockchain and crypto is just a natural extension of Collaborative's historical thesis. So if you think back to when Craig Shapiro uh, started the firm about a decade ago, you know, the idea of sharing economy and the idea of collaborative economy was not really an investment thesis that existed at that time, right? The idea of like staying at somebody else's house, like a stranger's house or getting in a stranger's car, having them drive you somewhere, like that was a very foreign idea. A lot of people didn't think it was going to work. And so he really was a, a, a pioneer at sort of outlining the investment thesis around the sharing economy. And so over time, Collaborative built a really strong brand um, around this concept. And of course, like if you think about blockchain, you think about a lot of the projects in blockchain, a lot of them have the same ethos of, of collaborative and sort of um, democratization and that sort of thing and so collaborative just started seeing a lot of deal flow around blockchain and crypto because they had this historical strength around sharing economy and so a lot of people in uh, the network whether it be former founders or co-investors um, just started sending deal flow over and so collaborative began investing out of the main fund um, actually several years ago into blockchain 
And what became clear over time is that it really needed a dedicated effort. Uh, it needed its own team. It needed people that were focused on crypto every day, um, thinking about the space, thinking about how it's going to evolve. And so that's what really led um, to this separate team. So you've got me and you've got Brian Chang out in uh, San Francisco and you've got Matt Lucas in New York. And so the three of us are focused on uh, crypto every day. So, I mean, I focus on crypto both as a professor uh, and as part of this fund. So it's very symbiotic in that way. Um, and then you've got other partners like Craig Shapiro and, and Taylor Green um, who are also working on the fund, but they're also splitting time between the, the main fund. And so it, I would say how Collaborative became interested in it is really that it is just a natural outgrowth of, of the things that Collaborative has been investing in for, for a decade. Um, and in your opinion, what is the current state of crypto-oriented venture capital on the whole? Yeah, so I think what we've seen is that you've really got two types of investors in the crypto ecosystem. You've got um, hedge funds, and then you've got venture funds. And although we will you know, co-invest in the same projects, uh, the, the style of the investors is actually quite different, right? Because hedge funds uh, bring money in, but then investors can also redeem. And so generally the, the time horizon is shorter in the way that they look at investments. Um, it's harder for them to get into something that's really illiquid. Uh, whereas venture investors, and so that would be like placeholder, it would be like collaborative, you know, there's several venture investors that are now really active in this space. Um, we think of ourselves more as long-term capital, right? So when we engage in a project, we don't anticipate, you know, selling it right after launch or really selling it at any time for probably several years or, or many years. So historically, the way VC funds work is you raise capital, you get commitments anyway, and then you raise capital as you find investments. And then you really will grow those companies for five, six, seven, up to 10 years even um, before the exit. Now with crypto, it's a little different because if you're investing in a token model, uh, you really have the option to exit at almost any time once that token is, is liquid and, and publicly traded. Uh, but I think in terms of your question around the, the state of, of crypto VC, I think that we're mostly looking at these as very long-term projects that, you know, like most venture investors, we want to get involved with the team. We want to try to add value. We want to try to help them grow, help them recruit, help them, you know, with the model, sort of anything we can do to help create our own success. Um, that's really the, the, the way we approach things. And I, I think that's going to be a winning model because many of these are going to be very long-term plays, right? They're going to take a long time to sort of, um, develop and, and get adoption and get traction. And, uh, Club Crypto has already, um, been investing in several projects like Maker, for example, Zeppelin. Um, can you share some of the criteria for investments? What's kind of projects, what kind of impact of these projects you are looking at. And also in one of your materials, you mentioned uh, your crypto thesis that uh, you make your investment decisions based on. Um, so can you tell more about that as well? Our thesis, you know, to, to kind of like encapsulate it in a sentence, we think that what the internet did to media, blockchains are going to do to finance, right? So if you kind of break that sentence down and think about it, you know, with the way media was impacted once the internet came on the scene was that the distribution methods changed and the incumbents all had to change their business models because like all the rules of the game about how consumers um, access content and share content changed. Now, it doesn't mean they all went away, right? Like New York Times now, instead of um, you know, mostly distributing through papers, mostly distributing um, digitally. And so it's not that the incumbents can't change, but it is that um, it has a massive impact in the way people interact with the industry. And so we believe the same is going to happen to finance. So we think these systems are going to result in compression of costs in a lot of different ways. We think it's going to be um, compression in the cost of issuance, uh, in the cost of trade, and ultimately in the cost of capital. 
it, it, if you think about it, you know, blockchains are really just protocols that are specially designed to move value as opposed to moving other types of information. So when we think about the industry and we think about, you know, where are the right places um, to invest, we think about where does value move because those are the places that are going to be impacted. And so there's lots of verticals within that. There's, there's payment systems, there's insurance, there's tokenized securities, and then there's all the technology that is the underpinning of all those things. So privacy solutions um, like Starkware. And, and so we're kind of interested in, in all of those verticals. Um, that would be considered our core. And then we'll make a few non-core uh, investments as well. Uh, probably not directly in utility tokens, but potentially in networks where there's a utility token involved. And just uh, yeah. crypto collab, uh, invest in only in equity or in tokens as well. Uh, so we'll do both. So we, I would say we have a preference for equity. We'll probably do more equity deals than we will do uh, token deals. It, that's our history, right? We're, we're venture equity investors. We understand that space and how value accrues to the asset really well. That said, I don't think you can really um, adequately invest in this space without taking positions in tokens as well, right? So if you look at Maker, for example, um, Maker is a token, right? And um, there's really no way to access that type of investment without taking a position in a token. So it'll probably be something like 80% equity, 20% uh, tokens. And in some cases, when you invest in equity, you end up with tokens, right? So if we made an equity investment in a company and then they subsequently launched a network and issued tokens, we would end up with tokens as well. And so I, I think it really is going to be a mix of both. And you're, well, just what you said about, you know, this future of finance, you're obviously contributing to it like in a great way, but there is, you can't do it on your own, right? And um, you collaborate with big industry players, such as like Bitstamp, for example. And you mentioned this collaboration in one of your articles. And can you tell us what are the objectives of this collaboration? Uh, we have a strategic partnership with Bitstamp. I was actually um, just visiting the headquarters uh, a month ago while I was over here in Europe. I figured I'd, I'd go visit them. So Bitstamp, as you probably know, is the longest standing crypto exchange in the world um, and the largest by volume in Europe. And so they're a great partner for us. And we try to add value in, in both directions. We try to add value to them as well. So uh, they don't really have a venture arm, right? So they can send um, interesting things that they're seeing in the market over our way for valuation. And vice versa, we can um, relay information about what we're seeing in the market, you know, new types of things that are coming up that might not be on their radar um, as they think about, you know, how to expand, what assets to list, how they're going to approach things like lightning and so on. And so I think really it's like we each make our own decisions, right? So we make our own investment decision. They make their own listing decision. Uh, it, it's not a situation where we're going to force anything down each other's throat. Um, but I think there are ways in which we can uh, add a lot of value to each other. And so that really is the objective of the partnership. And talking more about collaborative efforts, you are also a member of Security Token Academy. I think probably one of the most active organizations in the space. Um, what are the main objectives of Security Token Academy and how do you contribute to its development? Security Token Academy is a media and advocacy group. Um, they produce uh, sort of high quality video content. They're really trying to educate the space. They're trying to educate issuers. They're trying to educate investors. And they're doing that primarily through content generation um, and conferences. So we did a couple conferences in New York last year. Uh, we did one in June and we did one in October. Um, both were sold out. That's right. They, they were fantastic events, uh, as you know, because you were there. Um, and I think it really brought the industry together and it kind of demonstrated how much activity there is along so many different dimensions. It allowed, you know, different people to meet each other that maybe hadn't met before or only followed each other on Twitter. Um, and so it's been a it's been a really good kind of um, it's been a really good kind of structure um, for the industry. And so they have a bunch of, of corporate members, um, which they're doing, you know, actively uh, doing various events with. And 
I think the objective, again, is really just education. So one thing I would mention is that they have something called the Security Token Edge, which is a weekly newsletter. Um, so the director of strategy over there is a guy named uh, Derek Schloss, who's a really good friend of mine. And I actually think this is like the best um, compilation of security token related news uh, that you can get on, on a weekly basis. So I would say if any of your viewers that are interested in security tokens, definitely go to Security Token Academy website and there'll be somewhere where you can subscribe to Security Token Edge. And then every week in your inbox, you get a sort of summary of, of everything that's happened in the space, uh, which is great. The other thing I'll mention about them is they have a new initiative called Crest. Um, and, and that has to do specifically with, let's see, the acronym, I guess, is Commercial Real Estate Powered by Security Tokens. And so that's going to be an initiative that's entirely focused on real estate. Because, of course, there's, there's lots of verticals within security tokens. Uh, um, and real estate is a, is a huge one. It's trillions and trillions of dollars. It's probably the largest asset class on Earth. Um, and so they've now they've started to focus um, kind of a, a sub brand, I guess it is, um, just to focus on that space as well. So a lot of participants of Security Token Academy are infrastructure projects. So platforms for tokenization, secondary market platforms. And do you think from a perspective of, from, of a venture capitalist, are these um, infrastructure projects good investments? And what does it yeah, take so, to make a good one? Yeah, uh, it's definitely a space we're looking at actively. I'm sure that we will have some exposure to the platforms um, in this fund. Uh, what we're trying to do is be careful about um, creating conflicts. So the the hard part sometimes is once you invest in one, you don't want to invest in a direct competitor. Uh, so we're trying to be really careful. But the other thing we found, so uh, I'll give you a little anecdote. So before I was in crypto, I was involved with um, commercial drones. So their commercial drones were not legal in the US uh, when we started this company called Skyward back in 2012. And initially, you had all these entrants in the early days, and everybody wanted to do everything, right? And so it felt like we were going to compete with everybody. But then what happened is, as the space matured, everybody found the right niche for them, right? And so you ended up actually collaborating between a lot of these companies rather than competing directly. Because what you found is you weren't going to build the whole stack yourself, right? You could focus on a, a single piece of the stack. And so I expect the same to happen to some degree with security tokens is that even though you've got a lot of companies that are all trying to do everything initially, I think some are going to find that they're better at you know, the issuance side, some are going to find that they're better at like the technology layer and servicing the assets over time. Some are going to find that they're better for the secondary market trade. And so you will see some um, kind of, I guess I'm not sure what the right word is, but, you know, divergence of business models um, as the space matures. And so we will almost certainly invest in, in one or more um, of these of these plays because these are the early players that are going to set the foundation uh, for the space. There's, I think there's a lot of interest in, you know, former crypto industry uh, towards tokenized assets. But like, I think the main, the main goal here is to, um, to attract people from non, previously non-crypto, maybe non-finance space, who are not very familiar with the concept itself. Uh, and how do you usually explain to somebody who has never dealt with uh, this concept at all, the benefits of tokenization? I think this is where my background as a professor helps some because I'm very accustomed to uh, sort of teaching people about things for the first like, time. And, complex and <laughs> they, you know, the, I think the, the key is you have to focus on the benefits, right? So, uh, you know, no one's going to adopt this because it's blockchain. They're going to adopt it because there are some features that they can't get at, you know, through any other architecture. And so, you know, a lot of times when we, when we talk about uh, the benefits, we mostly will frame it around costs, right? So compression in the cost of issuance, of course, like if an issuer can, can save some capital, um, they, they're going to want to do so. Um, and also, I think, you know, always secondary market trade comes up 
for some, they feel like that's more important than others. Uh, some are just looking to basically have a more efficient system for moving investors in and out, but not necessarily like publicly listing it. Um, I've been involved with some real estate deals um, in my home state in Oregon. And one of the things I've noticed is that, you know, once you set up um, these organizations to own a building, even if it's just like eight or 10 investors, it's actually quite costly just to move an investor in and out of that partnership or that LLC or however it's structured. And so that's something where tokens could relieve um, some of that friction. I think the other thing is that uh, the idea is that as more and more investors get onboarded to this space, the idea is that they're going to be able to access a larger pool of capital uh, for the initial raise and for secondary market trade than they would otherwise. Because most of the platforms you have to fractionalize assets right now, they're sort of like little silos, right? So if you think about all the real estate platforms, right? You can, you can sign up, you can get an account, you can invest a small amount in a building, like $5,000, $10,000, but then um, your only real option to sell is typically back to the company or sometimes there's not much liquidity at all. You definitely can't take the assets off that platform and bring them to a different platform. And so usually when we talk about the benefits of um, tokenization, it's usually really boils down to interoperability. The idea that you can hold it in whatever wallet you want, you can trade it on a variety of different exchanges, you know, whichever one appeals to you. And that flexibility is going to become more and more important over time as, as the space grows. But all these benefits, they're not quite there yet, because none of them actually exists to its full potential right now at the moment. But what do you think will be the main driver for blockchain adoption worldwide? So these benefits could actually come into life to their full scale. Yeah. So, you know, what we always tell people is that a blockchain will reach mass adoption when no one knows they're using blockchain. Right. So the idea is that it has to, as I mentioned before, it has to enable features that people desire. Right. So, you know, I always think back to this, you know, the Y Combinator motto, make something that people want. Like that's the key. Right. It, it's it, even though the tech is really cool, the tech has to solve a problem in order to get mass adoption. And you're starting to see this more and more, right? So projects are starting to abstract away some of the technological complexity so that anyone, even if they don't, you know, I, I always draw this analogy with email, right? If you had to really understand how SMTP worked in order to use email, you would, like most people wouldn't use it, right? It, it can't be the case that we force people to understand all the intricacies of blockchain in order to use blockchain. It has to be the case that they can just get on and use it through an interface that makes it really comfortable and not know what a hash function is. Of course, like, you know, for us, like the geeks, like we're going to dive into that stuff and be fascinated by it and think about it and think about how to improve, um, you know, the tech underlying infrastructure. Um, but for the general public, they're just not going to dive in. They're not going to dedicate the time uh, or the fixed cost, we say, to kind of getting up to speed on, on the tech. So it has to be the case that they can interact with it in a way that feels as easy as interacting with Facebook or email or logging on to Fidelity or kind of like any of the other interfaces that they use. And I think we're getting there. I mean, I think the space definitely appreciates that. And a lot of the early stage stuff that we're seeing come to market now is mostly around really clean user interfaces, really easy user adoption. And so I'm, I'm hopeful. Okay, thank you very much, for Stephen, for uh, these insights. It was very interesting and it's a pleasure to have you with us at Value Tokenized. Actually, uh, when, when, we, when we started to explore um, security token spaces on our projects over a year ago, Mm, I read and actually translated in Russian one of your articles, I think security taken yeah. pieces. Yeah. And awesome. so, yeah. <laughs> so I think I can say that our security taken journey started to some extent with um, your articles, with well, your so. work. So <laughs> thank you for the kind words. It's always great to hear that. Pleasure to be here. Take care. This was value tokenized. Thank you for watching. 
Subscribe to our Twitter for fresh news and short videos on tokenization. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done it yet. And feel free to ask questions to our guests in the comments below. Bye. Bye-bye.